And our next speaker is uh, Dr. Christy Dunst. Uh, she's, uh, I have the pleasure of working with her in Portland, and she's going to uh, discuss a little bit about the continuing controversy of how much workup is enough and what's uh, truly needed. Thanks, Lee. Um, do you guys want me to use this? Yeah. Or, okay. Cause usually for the Macs, they want a ma mouse. Um, thanks for inviting me to participate in this course. I'll try and um, get us back on time. But I think something that's very much been emphasized this morning already is that patient selection is going to be, or it has always been um, key to the selection of the appropriate anti-reflux surgery. As newer methods are entering the field, this is continuing to become more, more and more important. So I was asked to talk to you about working the patient up, how much is needed, and who should do it. I have no disclosures. So the purpose of the GERD evaluation from a surgeon's perspective is a little bit different than from a gastroenterologist. We not only need to confirm the diagnosis, but we need to have an operative plan, and that's going to, to influence our informed consent for the patients. Clearly, a straightforward Nissen is a different discussion than a giant PEH. So this is the list of the major components of a preoperative uh, GERD workup, and we'll go through uh, each of these, starting with 24-hour pH and impedance testing. So ambulatory uh, distal esophageal pH testing has been the gold standard reflux test for decades, thanks to Dr. Demeester, and it continues to be. This can be catheter-based or wireless, and it quantitates and characterizes acid reflux. It is the best studied predictor of outcomes for anti-reflux surgery, and it is the most objective. It's also useful to confirm the adequacy of acid-suppressive medications. What about the proximal esophagus? Well, this is usually used in an attempt to help us sort out atypical symptoms, patients that have reflux symptoms and or pulmonary, laryngeal, pharyngeal, the whole gamut of, of problems. This can be accomplished with a dual channel pH probe, or there's, more, there's excitement in a, a newer pharyngeal only pH probe. But unfortunately, none of these um, studies with uh, proximal esophageal or pharyngeal pH have really helped us in our, uh, predict, in our ability to predict outcomes of anti-reflux surgery. In fact, I think that one of the things to keep wa to watch watch for is the uh, sputum pepsin that we saw presented yesterday or day before yesterday by University of Washington. As far as pH, this has not been too helpful. So, multi-channel intraluminal impedance has become increasingly important in the days of power of potent anti-secretory medications. This technology has been around for a while, but uh, I'm sure most of you have been seeing it more often lately. Impedance technology uses um, a multi, multi, or a long tube that goes transnasally with multiple uh, transducers. And the idea is that you get a baseline impedance reading in the lumen of the esophagus, and then as air or liquid passes by the transducer, you have a drop in the uh, resistance. This is a typical uh, tracing here that represents the bolus entry and exit across the transducer. So this allows us to um, measure not only acid reflux, but liquid. And this slide Dr. Demeester showed you, but I think it's very important. It demonstrates objectively something that we all know as surgeons, is that the PPI therapy does not change, it does not stop reflux. It doesn't do anything to the gastroesophageal reflux barrier, but it changes the composition of the refluxate. And this is now able to be demonstrated objectively with uh, more studies using uh, impedance. So the big question lately um, is, should you do a pH impedance testing on or off a PPI? And this study uh, by Pritchett shows um, their attempt to answer this very question. They had 39 patients with persistent symptoms on BID PPIs. They tested them with pH impedance, with pH impedance uh, combined technology and found that in this group of 39, all of them had normal acid scores on their medications, so none of them were uh, failures in that route. But 
64% had a normal impedance and 36% had abnormal impedance. So then they took them and separately tested their pH. So it wasn't a combined test off medication. They took their medications off for at least seven days and tested them with a uh, standard catheter. And this is the distribution. They found that 26% of them had a normal pH. 38% of them had an abnormal pH. 3% had a normal pH, uh, normal pH with abnormal impedance. And then there's the 33%, or 33% of the whole group had abnormal pH and abnormal impedance. And so what they conclude is that abnormal impedance on PPIs is predictive of acid reflux in 97% of those patients. You can see it's 13 out of 14 of those patients, even though it's only a third of the whole group. And that the combined technology using pH impedance probably gives you the most, um, uh, most information off medication. So let's look at what, how would we interpret these, each of these uh, groups of patients. So the easy one is normal pH, normal impedance. And that's probably, or it's unlikely that patient has reflux disease. Um, depending on, multi, you know, discussing with them their other symptoms and what else is going on, you know, often I just tell them, you don't have reflux, stop your PPI and see what happens, and we can retest you in six months or a year or whatever. But it seems uh, like they have an erroneous diagnosis. And the other easy one is the abnormal pH and abnormal impedance on medication. These patients have documented refractory gastroesophageal reflux disease. They have confirmed increased acid exposure in the distal esophagus, and they also have a pretty bad uh, reflux barrier because they continue to have significant abnormal impedance. So for those patients, we need an alternative treatment. I say alternative treatment because surgery is not the first thing that necessarily comes to the GI's minds these days. Most of them have been trying baclofen for these patients, but we all know they usually end up in our offices. So the two in the middle are a little more difficult, so we'll look at those. Someone who has an abnormal pH test off medication, but a normal impedance test on medication, basically has controlled GERD. Um, their, their question about whether or not um, they can get any benefit from anti-reflux surgery in the GI's mind. In my mind, you have to talk to them about their symptoms and find out exactly what's going on. They will at least benefit from um, stopping their medications, but you have to have that discussion with the patient. And then the last group, the normal pH abnormal impedance, basically this is saying that the patients are achlorhydric and they have a defective reflux barrier, not necessarily re related to each other, and that could be true and, and true, um, although very rare, and maybe those patients would benefit from anti-reflux surgery, but I would caution that this group of patients, which means an abnormal impedance only, the only thing they have abnormal on any of their testing is impedance, have to caution operating on them. What helps or may help in those patients, both of those groups, is to analyze their symptoms, and basically there's two methods the symptom index and the system, uh, symptom association probability. The symptom index is shown here, the number of times the symptom occurred with the pH less than four for acidic events, and then you can adjust it for weak, weak acid or non-acid, uh, divided by the total number of times the symptoms reported, and then converted to a percent. The positive symptom index is considered 50% or more, and this rep rep uh, represents the strength of the association. Whereas the SAP uses the contingency tables and reflects the probability that the association of symptoms and reflux is driven by chance. For example, a 95% SAP suggests that there's only a 5% uh, chance, or 5% chance that it was um, erroneous association. These two um, have not been proven. One has not been proven superior to the other. And there are uh, staunch advocates in both corners, uh, very well respected in their fields. But they can help. <clears throat> Dr. Demeester showed this slide about how the symptom index can be used to help sort out some patients um, by Dr. Castell's group. The key is <clears throat> the 168 patients are on medication, and 14% of them had no symptoms. So you, have, you can't do anything with that information. 
But if they have symptoms um, and you can get a symptom correlation, then you may be able to select uh, patients uh, better for surgery or at least be able to tell them their outcomes. So let's move on to motility. Um, we used to use water perfusion catheters for esophageal manometry, but now most everybody uses high-resolution manometry. If you are lucky enough to have a good uh, radiology department, you can use a contrast esophagram, video esophagram also to determine motility. But again, it was pointed out in a previous session a few days ago that um, this has to be a video. You have to be able to see the bolus transport. And then you can also use multi-channel interluminal impedance, which is usually an adjunct to high-resolution manometry. But either way, this should be tested. <clears throat> the question that everyone's been asking lately is, does esophageal dysfunction matter? And these are the things that we know. Peristaltic dysfunction increases with disease severity. 20 to 50% of GERD patients will have some sort of dysmotility. And we know that a full wrap is, is associated with increased dysphagia. And how do we define dysmotility? Ineffective esophageal motility, or IEM, was defined as 30% or more than 30% of swallows showing a failed or low amplitude contractions less than 30 millimeters of mercury. But 30 to 50% of patients with IEM will have a normal bolus transit, both that's been shown on video esophagram as well as with impedance testing. So there's been speculation um, that we should increase our threshold from 30 to 50%. This last statement's not surprising. Defining IEM by 50% will increase your specificity of dysphagia. So let's go with what I would consider a fact. Maybe it's not to everyone, but Nissen is contraindicated in achalasia. There are several studies, um, and here are two representative. So in patients that have no motility at all, we would not do a Nissen. But this nicely designed study, randomized trial, uh, aimed to look at this topic. Should we do, or can we do, a Nissen in every patient, or should we be using a tailored approach to decrease their postoperative dysphagia rates? They had 200 GERD patients, randomized 100 of them to Nissens, 100 to toupee, and I don't know how they did this, but 50% 50 50 of each group had IEM, and they defined it as 60% failed. And their outcomes, in short, were that both of these groups had excellent acid control. Tupe was the same as anisin. And importantly, the preoperative definition of IEM did not predict post-op dysphagia. So their conclusion was that we did not need to do a tailored approach. So I believe probably there is a dysphagia threshold. It's probably not like this. We think 30% IEM, it's black and white, do a tupe. It's probably not like that. It's probably not even 50%, as suggested but probably there is some sort of dysphagia threshold, and I think that manometry is still very important. You need to use some clinical judgment, but the people that are having, that have dysphagia and have really poor motility, you need to think about at least tailoring, their, tailoring your approach. So moving on to upper endoscopy with biopsy. The purpose of upper endoscopy for, this, for us, for surgery, is to define the hiatal hernia to help you with preoperative planning, and again, the consent issues, to determine the candidacy for an endoluminal procedure, or as, or as uh, Dr. Dremister just described, the links. We need to also be able to estimate the potential for esophageal lengthening procedure. You can get an idea for that, because that certainly in uh, increases their mortality, or morbidity and maybe the hospital stay. And then lastly, upper endoscopy is used to obtain biopsies, at least of the GE junction and squamoclaminar junction. We'll talk about this a little. My rationale for this is that we are seeing the extremes. As Dr. Demeester showed you, the GERD patients that are ending up in our office are the, are the very severe for the most part. This is gonna be the highest risk population for metaplasia or dysplasia. And I'm not going to rely on somebody else's endoscopy to say that the GE junction was normal when we know that there's significant inter-observer uh, variability, when you ask gastroenterologists to identify the GE junction in pictures, there is, it's hard to get a consensus. <clears throat> also, this becomes more difficult to define as we have an increased degree of anatomic derangement. And it's even more difficult after a fund application. So I, I think that we need to make sure that we biopsy 
the GE Junction, Squamish, Columnar Junction area to make sure that we're not missing an ultra short segment of Barrett's esophagus that will need to be followed up in the future. Contrast esophagram. The barium esophagram is used mostly for patients with extraesophageal or pul pulmonary uh, symptoms. This is to rule out diverticulum, especially in patients that have significant regurgitation of, of undigested food. It's also to rule out aspiration or oropharyngeal dysfunction as a cause of their problems. <clears throat> I was taught that this is also to rule out esophagobronchial fistula. I've never seen one. Um, but also, it's also helpful to evaluate the size and reproducibility of the hiatal hernia. This is just a picture of a patient that I have. That 60-year-old lady has had reflux forever, heartburn regurgitation. <clears throat> Her heartburn is completely resolved with PPI, and she's essentially happy. But she continued to have significant regurgitation. <clears throat> she's been scoped a million times. Finally, she came to our office. We obtained this x-ray, and this has been missed <clears throat> for who knows how long. Last, <clears throat> gastric emptying. Gastric emptying studies. What we've identified in our database is that 25% of GERD patients, <clears throat> at least that show up in your office, will have delayed gastric emptying gastroparesis. We looked at our patients to see if this mattered with this study published a few years ago. 559 patients with GERD. We split them up based on <clears throat> Um, our, our protocol at the time. If you had significant symptoms of delayed gastric emptying, <clears throat> you got a gastric emptying study. If the symptoms, um, <clears throat> if, this, if the study was grossly abnormal with a T1 half greater than 150 minutes, <clears throat> then you obtained a pyloroplasty, which is in the orange, with your Nissen. And if not, we figured that the fund application would <clears throat> would help your emptying. So here's the data. Excuse me. <clears throat> and you can see that in the orange, these are the severe, severe delayed gastric emptying patients who had the pyloroplasty. I don't show you the pre-op data, but I can tell you the symptoms all improved from pre-op to post-op, even though it looks pretty bad <clears throat> in the orange. But what comes out is that those patients, even though they have excellent reflux outcomes. The Nissen pyloroplasty patients still have a lot of problems afterwards, and their expectations with surgery need to be discussed carefully. The other thing that came out of this pretty importantly is that the group <clears throat> with mild delayed gastric emptying, or a T1 half of 90 to 150 minutes, had the worst outcomes. They're in the yellow, and they had worse, the worst gas bloat, the worst abdominal pain, and the worst flatulence problems when we did a Nissen alone. And that was surprising to us, of course. But we have now sen we have since considered pyloroplasty in all patients with an abnormal gastric emptying study um, because of this. So our conclusions then <clears throat> was that objective and subjective outcomes of GERD were equivalent in patients with and without, without delayed gastric emptying who have a Nissen um, as long as they have a pyloroplasty. Although improved, postoperative dyspeptic symptoms are worse in patients with delayed gastric emptying than those without. And patients with delayed gastric emptying without a pyloroplasty do have the worst outcomes. And then lastly, we did find a 25% incidence in diarrhea for patients that had pyloroplasty, and that certainly needs to be considered. So here's the checklist which we went through and why we would be using it. I would argue that perhaps a contrast esophagram is not necessary in every patient, but anyone who has significant regurgitation or atypical symptoms should probably get one. And gastric em emptying studies can be used um, also selectively. My last question that I was asked to address was, who should do it for the sake of time? And because I really don't think it's much of a discussion, the answer is you. I don't think that you can determine if a patient is a candidate for an endoluminal procedure, a lynx, a parasophageal repair, and this and without looking at it yourself. Also, there's a lot of quality issues to consider when looking at uh, outside uh, manometry and pH impedance testing. Thanks. <clears throat>